Hey everybody, Dr. Ben Edwards here. Today we're gonna to talk about ways to prevent or decrease your susceptibility to COVID-19. So some people ask me if you can reacquire, re get reinfected with COVID. The exact strain you shouldn't be able to as long as you're not immunocompromised. I mean, if you have zero immune system, like you're on an immunocompromising drugs for maybe an autoimmune condition, or you have AIDS, you know, if you have a major immunocompromised state, you can have the same bug come over and over. But otherwise, if you've seen this, you should be fine. Now, there are the mutations I talked about. And just like with influenza, you know, the flu shot, they put about two or three different strains of influenza into that flu shot, but there's 200 other strains. So it's kind of the same deal. There's these different varieties, different strains, and it's potentially possible to get a different um, mutational strain of COVID-19. But again, I think your immune system should recognize it as long as your immune system is competent and you are supporting your immunity. So a quick word about herd immunity. It's a little bit controversial for some reason now, um, but with the, again, the studies are pretty clear on, it appears most of the populations of, in the different countries in the world uh, already have some sort of natural immunity to COVID-19. So you have to understand our immune system has many different branches to it. Think of the military here in the United States. So there's the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, there's the Border Patrol, the Coast Guard, all these different branches. The same with our immune system. So we have what's called mucosal immunity. So think of your, your mucosal, that's the lining of the nose, the mouth, the airways, your gut, your intestine. So you have special immune system cells, IgA, they line the mucosal. And there is some IgA protection against COVID. Then you have T cells. These are like your snipers, the Marines, and they're specific um, T cells that recognize COVID-19 for some reason, even though you've never seen it before. And it appears there's some cross reactivity or recognition because enough of the coronavirus called COVID-19 has some similar properties or uh, some identification markers on it um, that, that are similar to the common cold coronavirus. So there's cross reactivity of our immune system. And there's just other native immunity that we already have and it appears up to 80% of, of any given population is already resistant to or immune to this COVID-19, which is awesome. And then there's the antibodies that we can develop when we are exposed to COVID-19. I'm sure you've heard about that with the antibody testing. But the bottom line is we already had some immunity to this. So if 80% of a community already has immunity and then the COVID-19 virus comes into that community and infects 5%, 10%, up to that last 20%, then basically the virus has nowhere else to go. It kind of burns itself out. So that's this predictive curve that we've seen all along. And Dr. Michael Levitt, who's a um, Stanford um, PhD doctor, he predicted, he's an epidemiologist, he predicted these curves and he was accurate. He was right on the money with every single curve. Um, and it's not because he was a lucky guesser, it's because historically you can see how viruses act and how this herd immunity threshold behaves and it's just a mathematical calculation. So again, we knew this pretty early on in the spring, really um, even before March. Um, so why we didn't get that out in the news and kind of calm everybody's fear, I'm not real sure. So this kind of speaks towards the second wave. We've heard, is there gonna be the second wave? Well, if we've developed herd immunity, um, then we shouldn't see a second wave. We, so in the fall, we'll see just the typical other viruses. Now I did mention earlier, COVID-19, now there are 30 different mutations of it, it appears, and there will be more probably. So will one of these mutations be different enough that our immune system doesn't recognize it enough and it's able to cause a lot of fatalities again? I don't know for sure, but probably not because mutations usually aren't that great of a change. So I really don't think we're gonna see an uptick in the fall. Now we will we will see just the normal um, viral season. So the, all the different adenoviruses and coronaviruses and rhinoviruses and para-influenza viruses and influenza viruses. You know, the CDC, every single flu season, will go around the country and set up testing centers for people that think they have the flu. When you get, go get your flu swab to see if you have the flu, the CDC will collect 100,000 of these at each testing center. 
and then they'll go determine and, and see how many of these are actually influenza. And over the last 20 years, on average, only 15% of people that think they have the flu actually have influenza, 15%. That means 85% of the people that have a really bad cold, cough and achy and all that, have other viruses, 85% of the people. So we will see these other viruses like we see every year come up. I think probably though, and unfortunately, the susceptible people for 2020 have already perished when they were exposed to COVID-19. So we don't have as much um, what some people in the medical literature are terming dry tender. I know that's, that's a probably horrible term, but that's the term they're using. Kind of like in a forest fire, if you have a lot of susceptible um, fuel ready to burn you're more susceptible to a fire so the most susceptible people actually there aren't as many because um, we had this um, tw uh, late spring coronavirus COVID-19 so we'll see what the fall brings but I don't suspect we'll see a second wave I think our immune system has seen this bug and we've now built herd immunity and it won't be an issue time will tell that doesn't mean let your guard down from a host defense standpoint there's always going to be more viruses coming but it's never going to be about the virus. It's always going to be about the terrain. So the germ theory focuses on the germ. But everybody forgets about Claude Bernard. And he said, the germ is nothing. The terrain is everything. And that's what I believe. That's what we believe at our clinic. If you can get the host defenses, get your terrain optimized, then it doesn't matter if COVID-19 reemerges or not, or if COVID-20 comes or any other virus or bacteria, we know some are gonna come in the future. That, don't focus on the numerator, focus on the denominator, focus on your host defenses. So this fall, I'm not saying not be worried, be vigilant always. But you know the real epidemics, none of these viruses. <laughs> Heart disease and cancer, those are your top two killers in the world, in, in America for sure, but in the Western world. Well, guess what? The things that make you susceptible to the real pandemic of heart disease and cancer and Alzheimer's and 54% of our kids now have a chronic disease, the things that make you susceptible to that are the same things that make you susceptible to COVID-19. The CDC even came out and said 94% of people who were labeled a COVID-19 death had other conditions. They had other diseases. COVID-19 only killed by itself 6% of this whole um, death associated with COVID-19. So it's all related. The things that are gonna make you susceptible to disease make you susceptible to germs too. It all has to do with host defenses. So I've been asked a lot about the COVID test and where we are now um, in September is what I've termed case-demic. We're here to see in, pandemic's over, that death rate, that death curve was done at the end of August, we're back to normal, but the cases continue to rise and that's what the media has been talking about. So we're in this case-demic is, is how we've termed it, all these rising cases. But what does that even mean? The majority of these people don't even have symptoms. So as far as I know, pre-COVID-19, doctors only label someone a case of anything. <laughs> a case of diabetes or a heart a case of heart attack or cancer or any case is if you had symptoms but we've now said if you have a positive test you're a, you're a case of COVID-19 so let's talk a little bit more about these tests number one just in a nutshell they're inaccurate period <laughs> viruses are very very difficult to detect and one of the main tests that we've been using to make policy on and to keep things shut down and to kind of scare people with is a PCR test. We talk a little bit about PCR. The guy that invented the PCR test and won a Nobel Prize for it actually said, don't use this test to try to diagnose a viral illness. His words, not mine. He said it's not a good test to use. And here's why. Because it's a manufacturing technique. The PCR test is a photocopy machine. That's pretty much it. All it does is, is make copies of DNA material. So with this test, you get the swab back in the, through the nose and your sinuses and throat, and that swab, that Q-tip, picks up genetic material. So this is some of your genetic material from your, your the skin that lines your sinuses. So there's human DNA, there's other bacteria, there's other viruses. So there's just a lot of genetic material on that Q-tip. And they go take that Q-tip 
and run it through this machine that just photocopies and makes copy after copy after copy of all this genetic material. Because if you just took that Q-tip and looked for the COVID virus, there'd be such little DNA material, you couldn't even detect anything. So you have to amplify it or copy it. So here's what's happening with PCR. Guess how many times they're copying or amplifying your genetic material from your swab? 37 to 40 times is what most labs are doing that I've looked at. But what the studies show, multiple studies show, that once you get over 24 copies, 24 cycles we call it, or amplifications, there's such little viral material. You have to amplify so many times to even detect the viral material. It's not enough viral material in the person to be symptomatic or contagious. Anything over 24 cycles, you can't spread that viral material. So you have to have a whole lot of virus in you to be able to spread viruses. But these positive tests are called positive because they're amplifying that material so many times. One paper showed if you amplify everyone 40 cycles, you make 40 photocopies of this genetic material, everyone will be positive. Everyone, 100% positive rate. If you amplify it only 30 times, everyone will be negative. There's just not enough COVID-19 DNA material to even detect. So as you can see, hopefully I didn't confuse you too much. What I'm saying is it's an inaccurate test. And that's why up to 90% of the tests now they're calling false positives. The people have no symptoms. They're not contagious. They can't spread it. There's so little viral fragment material left in them that it, it's meaningless. But they're counted as a positive case. And I've had some of these positive cases come back to our clinic to get tested five times in a row every day for five days because their boss won't let them come back to work until they have a negative test. Well, every single one of those five, same person, but five positive tests, we have to report to the health department. So there's inaccuracy in reporting, there's inaccuracy of the test itself. Um, and we really need to consider the fact that this virus isn't spreading if you're asymptomatic, if you don't have symptoms. So we should limit our testing to symptomatic people. We should limit our treatment to symptomatic people. We should limit our social distancing mask wearing to symptomatic people. Quarantine and do things to sick people, healthy people, let them go live their life, encourage them to boost their own immunity. And then even if they got the virus, their immune system so strong, they knock it out. Now they're one of the herd immunity people and we can protect the elderly better that way. Let the younger, and healthier people be exposed, let them interact, let them be in the community, let them go to work, let them go to school, let them go to social functions and interact with each other, while at the same time encouraging good host defenses. That would be a smart way to go in my opinion.